I think, for example, this one. Yeah. So you remember this this um, thing. So the the ideal situation in the ideal situation you would have a photon count detector like shown in this picture that it really counts how many photons come in and in the ideal detector like here this is a mathematical <laughs> illustration only each pixel is is doing exactly the same thing and now we are sending 1000 photons uh, from from these three different along these three different x rays so we are sending exactly 1,000 photons, and we are using identical pixels uh, to, to measure what comes through. And then, as you may recall, the calibration is first to take a logarithm to counteract the Baer-Lambert law, and then uh, subtract these numbers from the empty space. So this is, this is the number of the empty space ray. So if we subtract each of these numbers from 6.9, we actually get our line integral information. So this is what, what you should be doing. However, in practice, it is slightly more complicated than this. And let me explain uh, in what exact way is it more complicated. Um, so for that, let me... Let me uh, open some data. So actually, this is this is a data set I took with with Zenit Purisha a while ago. Uh, the idea here is to study a temporary, uh, I mean, an object changing in time. So we have this kind of little movie. Our our photography system is <laughs> not nearly perfect yet. We will perfect it hopefully in the future, but this is a little wobbly representation of 15 frames of our changing emoji subject from little mosaic stones, which actually are among the choices you can have. I mean, what object do you want to image? One possibility is to take these little ceramic stones and, and make your own picture and recover it. So this is what we did, and for each of these 15 frames, uh, we took those 360 views. I think 360. Uh, no, we did only 60 angles, but anyway. So uh, when measuring, there need to be taken two, two uh, calibration images. Two calibration images called... Uh, background and shading. So this is one of the images coming from the detector. As you see, it's completely black, but uh, the image actually does contain some data, but however, the operating system here uh, cannot show this 16-bit TIFF where I guess the image data is somehow maybe not spanning the full dynamical range. So here you see nothing, but if we open this thing uh, in MATLAB, we will see stuff. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, not open, but I think uh, maybe I just How can I most quickly go here? Maybe this one. Okay, and then... Mm. So let me take the image in <coughs> and let me recall what was its name, background. I will get the image in. Oh, why doesn't it exist? Come on. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it didn't. Maybe I should try to run this. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Better. So now we have the image in, and let's just take a look. Okay, so here you have it. And maybe we should do grayscale. Oh, here we have the beautiful <coughs> image. What do you say? So nice, so nice. Uh, maybe we could actually... Uh, Let's zoom in a little bit and you will see there, there is something in the image, but it's kind of hard to say what it is. Uh, I think we should maybe... Um, let me try to show it in a little bit. Uh, let's see what is the maximum. Okay. This also tells why the operating system doesn't really show it so well, because all the information is between 64 and 397, although our range of possible values is 2 to the 16. So we have so many, so from 0 to 655335, we have uh, the dynamical range in the image, I mean the possible range in the image, however, the image only has values between these. So, let me actually show it, um, so something like 70 to 300, let's see how this looks like. Let's put it even less here. Okay, uh, I think now you see something. Something's going on here. It has this kind of weird stripes. So let me reveal that this image is actually taken without any x-rays on. No x-rays. So the camera, which is inside uh, a steel, or inside a metal container, there is no information, there are no photons coming to the, to, to the detector. So this is kind of the electronic noise background image. Also, it tells that the pixels are not identical. Like in the mathematical uh, ideal situation, we thought that all the pixels are measuring exactly the same thing. Well, here we see that when there are no photons coming in, every pixel should report zero, <coughs> zero photons came in. Uh, but as you see, all of the pixels seem to be reporting uh, a different number, and we have these weird stripes. So actually, uh, the stripes appear because of the internal structure of the detector. So it consists of slabs of uh, semiconductor material, whatever Hamamatsu uh, ha has, has used to build this detector. So this is something to be removed from the image. So this is, we need to calibrate for this different response uh, of each pixel. So we measure this image and actually to avoid, uh, to, to um, average away noise, what we do is we record 100 images of this kind. So there's 100 seconds, so like almost two minutes of, of waiting, letting the machine to take 100 images like this and then average all of them. So this here is an average of 100 images uh, with the idea that in each pixel anyway there is some random noise uh, whose um, whose accepted value, uh, I mean, expected value is zero, maybe, or at least around, yeah, the noise is, noise is zero centered, so after averaging we get a quite low noise image revealing what each pixel is doing. And how this image is used actually is that for every x-ray image you measure, later you will subtract this one. You subtract this one, and if any of the pixels after subtraction become negative, you replace that by zero. So that's a calibration step, and this is very much involved with the actual device we have. I mean, for another device from another manufacturer, maybe there would be another 
way to do it. But this is some step that needs to be done for every image you use. Okay, any questions about the background, background image? Also called dark field image sometimes. Okay, if not, that was it. And then uh, we do have also another image called uh, shading. Sometimes it's also called flat field. This is actually uh, what we saw here measuring through empty space. Uh, because we need this empty space measurement to calibrate these measurements that go through the material. But again, uh, in this simple thing, we, we do the empty space measurement in this pixel, and then we use the value for these two other pixels. But this may not be a good idea, because the pixels are not identical in practice. So we should actually measure this empty measurement for every pixel. So in practice, we first put nothing between the X-ray source and the detector. We take like empty images with, with nothing. And that's what, what this shading image is. So let's take a look at that in MATLAB as well. Mm. So here we should take the shading. Okay, and then let's see what are the maximum values of that one. So <coughs> it kind of seems to me that uh, we have a 12-bit analog to digital converter because the maximum pixel value is, is this one and this is suspiciously <laughs> the, the total span of a 12-bit uh, AD converter. And then... Uh, So this is now the range of pixel values in the shading image, or the flat field image. Mm. Just out of curiosity, who in the audience was aware of the existence of an AD converter, analog to digital converter, a concept? Three, four. Okay, so uh, AD converter appears in all kinds of measurement technologies. This, in these digital days, uh, we are measuring a physical parameter with some physical principle, but then for our analysis, uh, computer analysis, we need a number in a computer. So whatever is the analog device measuring, like you, you could think about your thermometer home when you, I mean, if you, if you have an old-fashioned one that just uh, physically, there is some, some liquid expanding and you can read out. But that's not a computer readable thing. So you need some kind of a digital, something converting the analog reading to a digital number. And that's what an AD converter does. And they uh, come with some bit depth. So depending on the AD converter, it has 8 bits or 12 bits or some bits. So if it's an 8-bit, then the numbers are between 0 and 255. And here seeing this 4095 uh, su strongly st suggests that we are using here a 12-bit AD converter, because for 12-bit the numbers are between 0 and 4095. Okay. Let's take a look at this image. Now I think these are these are not so good. Let's put some 200 and 4,000. Let's see how it looks like. Uh, so here we see the shading image or the flat field image. So there is nothing. It's just radiation coming in and it seems to me that the low pixel values are here probably because of some kind of mechanical thing or some, not mechanical, but I mean about the design of the camera. 
Uh, so I think we can put here like much more as the minimum point to maybe see see better what is there. So now we see a little non-uniformity, partly because the radiation field is a cone beam, so the center of the detector is a little bit closer to the X-ray source than the corners. So I think we are seeing what's called vignetting in, in photography, that towards the corners the image is a little bit darker. But that's really because of the physics. It's a little bit longer way and radiation gets weaker uh, in proportion to one over the square of distance because it's, it's kind of distributed along a sphere whose, whose uh, area will, will depend on the square of the distance. And also otherwise we see some kind of little stripes and little structure there. And all of this is just because it's a real world instrument and not a mathematical idealization. So this is also taken as an average of 100 images uh, with no object in the way. And this one we use for, for uh, calibrating for the empty space. Questions? Uh, why, why could we just use, use this one? Or why, why, don't, why do we need the former one? I mean, if it is the empty space picture, then, well, we could think that by subtracting this would be enough. But, just some kind of but this, one, this one we don't subtract. I mean, this one... If we think about if we think about this picture again, yeah, we need to pick it up because logarithm. Yeah, then. because you know, uh, at this point when we just did the photon count, uh, the first picture, the background had no radiation coming in. Yeah. So every pixel should report zero photons. Yeah. But they don't. Yeah. Yes. But okay, we might decide that we don't use that. Uh, however, what we do then. We take in uh, the photon counts not corrected with, with the background. Then we take a logarithm and then we subtract these numbers from the logarithm. Yes. So that's a nonlinear thing. So yeah. uh, I think the background correction, because that was done in a linear way, just subtracting the, the background image from the data. So it happens before the logarithm. So it needs to be done, because it, it cannot be compensated by anything that's done after the logarithm. Yeah. yeah. So these two images are really needed for calibrating the data. The first one, the background image, we subtract from every image, every picture we, we take, including including the, the flat field or, or the shading image. We subtract it from that one and we subtract, it, the, we subtract the background from every projection image we take. Be there an object between the source and the detector or not. Because that way we get uh, more correct photon counts for any image and then it's more reliable to use them. Yes. And then we have a bunch of we have a bunch of um, frames of bunch of images uh, for each. So we have 15 time frames. So for each frame, we have a little bit different object. We moved uh, it a little bit. And for each of them, we rotate and take 60, uh, 60 uh, images. So let's take a look at uh, one of these, these images. So this is called emoji frame. So let's go to here. And then 
again let's take this maximum and minimum okay and we can take a look I have no idea what would be a good range let's see how this looks like well here you see the object and you see that the stones are put uh, hopefully in the plane where where which is really in at the same same height than the x-ray source so when when this thing is rotating we should have their one plane through these little stones that that would be that would give good information so as you see it's really uh, it the line should be somewhere here in the middle to go because these stones are closer to the source they have larger magnification because it's a cone beam it will magnify and this is closer to the detector this stone so it's not magnified so much so that's how the data looks like and then we need to find out what is the correct line to use and then we pick out that one line from each of these projection images And I, I think I don't have here, oh, this one, yes. So here is uh, just what we call a quick and dirty reconstruction of the data, just to see that if, if everything is making any sense and so we initialize a sinogram so each picture has this number of columns and we have 60 uh, angles so the sinogram will have this size so we, we uh, initialize it as zeros and then we need to choose the row this actually we did manually we just checked <laughs> somehow found like 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 i just showed the picture and tried to look for uh, a good place that seems to be on the plane so that's what we did and and looked at what is the index of that row yes it would <laughs> so what one could look for the minimum maximum of, of where the object is but uh, also then assuming that you have put the object uh, to the right I mean you, your object is not necessary in physical space your object is not necessarily halfway above the correct horizontal plane and halfway below of course you should take care to do it so but uh, it's not so it's, it's a bit tricky in, in reality yes because with the machine, there's no calibration for that. I think yeah, yeah, Alexander actually now he has calibrated it, it very well. So I think now we it. We should know the row actually. Yeah, we should know the row. Yeah. However, when you place your object, that's something that you do by hand. Yeah, you put yeah. it there. So then you should check that that your object is nicely rotating within that row. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could make sure that your object is like let's say one centimeter high and kind of pretty much constant in the z direction and then it's kind of easy to make sure that part of the object is is in that row but for example one of these methods i'll be using you what to use uh, for for the object of measurement some of them are pretty thin so then <laughs> it will require some and also we so far we don't have computer controlled uh, z direction in the machine so you you need to physically push the platform into the holder uh, to the depth that's correct so there it's really something manual to do so 
a bit different from abstract algebra. You have to really go with your hands and, and adjust it. So then in this code, what we do, we just uh, make a loop over all the directions. Uh, we read in the image, and then we just um, put into the sinogram, we just put in uh, the column, no, the row, row from the image, what we want. And then we do the logarithm thing, and here actually we are not using the background image at all. So this is really a quick and dirty one. We, we, just, we don't even do that calibration step. And then we just do the sinogram, and we don't even use the shading image either. So we are just subtracting from the maximum of the sinogram. So pretty much like what, what, what was done in the ideal mathematical slide I showed you. So this is really not, not calibrating properly at all. But anyway, anyway, uh, if we run this, mm, I think maybe we should So here is now uh, a sinogram of, of frame one. And this is what you would work with. You get the sinogram. Well, of course, first using the background image and then using the shading image properly. And then you will get uh, the calibrated sinogram. And Zenit and Alexander will make you a matrix that corresponds to your measurement. And that's what you get get when you go here. Uh, I think we probably should be able, why, why don't I have the... Hmm. We could just for fun, we could uh, actually see what happens if we do... if we do um, parallel beam reconstruction just for fun. So if we do iradon, let's give it the sinogram. So this is now assuming parallel beam, and this is not para, this is very much fan beam. It's fan beam, meaning like it's coming from one. Yeah, one point, yeah, that's right, yes. So cone beam is a 3D concept, uh, it's like an ice cream cone, so it's, uh, the radiation emanates from one point yeah. in a cone-like fashion. And when we restrict uh, to a horizontal plane, then uh, it looks like a fan, because it's the restriction of the cone to, to yeah. a plane. Yeah, that's the fan beam geometry. And here, uh, let's see, uh, we should have one to sixty, or maybe zero to fifty-nine. Maybe it doesn't matter so much. Time, I guess, six degrees. I read on. Okay, what did I forget? I forgot something. What was it? Mm. Hmm. Oh, huh. yes. I was wondering about it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let's put axis equal. So you see something, uh, I think here is the one eye of the emoji and here's another eye and here is supposed to be the mouth and you see a little bit of the... It even seems to be a bit outside the domain as well, so it's a very poor reconstruction and violating all the assumptions and all that. But anyway, you can see that uh, it's, it's roughly, there's something roughly meaningful going on. 
Okay. Yes. I think the row is okay here, but um, it may yeah it may be a problem with choosing the row, but it also it's also a big problem with uh, applying parallel beam inversion to a fan beam measurement. So the geometry is really and this is really fan beam because uh, our measurement was quite big in size or, or the object. So. Does it have to do with one eye being closer than the other? That's why one of them is more visible than the other. Could be. Could be. But there, there really should be a big distortion <laughs> because we are using the wrong geometry and also it's quite it's sparse angle because it's only 60 angles. So for filtered back projection, that's already kind of a low number of angles. So, uh, I mean, from this picture, one shouldn't expect too much quality anyway. I use the eye radon here because for the eye fan beam, um, there is... It's more complicated. There are much more parameters to give in that I, I really don't remember by heart. Yeah. But if you say something you <coughs> give us that actual matrix or yes, yes. So we don't have to figure it out. No, you don't have to. You will you will get a, a matrix A and a, a sinogram M, like we have all, in in this course all the time. We have this uh, A F equals M measurement model. So you will get the matrix A and you will get the M tilde, the measurement that comes from reality. Yeah. The sinogram. But do we get the sinogram ready or can we have like do we get the pictures and we build the sinogram? You will in, in the measurement session you will build the sinogram there. Yeah. Yeah sure. And and uh, I think just to make also a quick and dirty reconstruction with uh, with uh, I fan beam to see that everything seems to be correct and okay and calibrated and all that. So I think you, you, when you walk out of the measurement session, you should have the, the measurement matrix and the sinogram and uh, a check image by I fan beam showing that, that the data is, is reasonable and meaningful. And then it's a matter of throwing away some of the angles as you wish in your project and applying some regularization method we studied in the course. Any other questions about the measurement session before we go to the objects? Oh. If not, let's go to the objects and if you come up with questions you can ask at any time. But I will stop this video thingy right now and we'll go to the objects. <laughs>